Hi, welcome to this week's episode of Pensado's Plays. He's Dave, I'm Herb, and in a minute, you're going to meet one of the high priests of our world, the one, the only Greg Wells. But first, as you watch this particular episode, that means the holidays have officially kicked off. So we're instituting something new we call Pensado's Preferred. That way we can highlight seasonal opportunities on gear and software and other things that come our way, and we can pass it your way. So first up, our good friends at Warm Audio are providing 15% off across the board on all their fabulous gear. You know, we're a fan of their gear, as solid as it can be, mics, compressors, EQs, preamps, the whole shebang. Savings, in some cases, over $200 off pieces of gear, offers good all the way through December 31st. You can get more info at warmaudio.com or at any Warm Audio authorized dealer because they are Pensado Preferred. Uh, also remember to check out the Blackbird Academy's live classes. You know how we feel about that school. There are openings in January and April. Incredible teachers, great placement service, and exposure to best-in-class practitioners of that particular craft. The founder of the school, John McBride, still does live work every single weekend at concert halls all around the globe. To check it out, go to blackbirdacademy.com or email directly to karma at theblackbirdacademy.com. Um, and just so there's some context globally, in America, Thanksgiving starts our holidays. And what we try to use it as a time to reflect see loved ones, shut it down a bit, count your blessings, and and step back for a second. I think that's good advice no matter what country you live. So we encourage you to do the same. Just just bring it down for a bit, step back. It actually will help your creativity. Um, And so as we thank you for liking and subscribing and notifying right here, we hope you take that moment to hug your loved ones, get off the treadmill, and breathe deeply, okay? Now, we dug deep in the crates and gone way back. Blast from the past for this week's Into the Lair. Dave, what is it? It's really a blast from the past. Uh, making your mixes loud. This is the way I was doing it a while ago with just some compression and some EQ. I think you'll both enjoy it and uh, find it interesting. Check Here it out. Here we go. Roll it. The last episode, last ITL, I showed you how to get the, the, the track sounding really, really loud. So now I'm going to break down one, one, maybe two elements. We'll see how the time goes and show you individually how EQ and compression contribute to that overall thing. In other words, you can't, you can't just expect, like we said last week, you can't just expect to slap a, uh, something across the stereo bus and have it be as loud as it can possibly be. You want to kind of prepare things before they get to the stereo bus. So in keeping with that concept, let's start with a kick drum. This is what I started with. Pretty doggone good sounding kick drum. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with that. But now, what I'm hearing that I'm gonna need further down the road is a lot more mid-range, uh, a little more sub, and that sound that just makes it come through laptop speakers like it's bigger than life. So let's see how we can get that with a kick drum. First thing I did was um, add a little bit of compression and took out something right, in, right around thousand. Not quite sure why I did that, but. So you notice we're getting, we're getting a little bit of the mid-range beat, like, like we talked about the last episode. We're, we're, we're messing with the Fletcher Munson curves in our ears. Now, I wanted a little more mid-range meat, so I, I, I put together a sample, a um, couple of samples. Looks like something that sounds like Stargate, something that sounds like Get I mixed together. And this is just for mid-range. I'm not trying to get anything low out of it. And because I want to get knock out, some knock out of it, I, I ran it through Transient Designer. And then I'm taking out, looks like, looks like I'm taking it around 435. That's kind of that papery sound. In other words, just I'm still trying to, to give the compressors down the line exactly what they want to make them happy. OK, 
okay with me okay and then right here what we got got a little bit more EQ a little bit of boost to make up for some that we're losing along the way now here comes the bad boy now this 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 track and this track the two kick drums I'm, I'm sending to bus 57 which is my parallel track this parallel track so I'm going through this compressor now I'm choosing a slow attack time if I use a faster attack time you see what I'm losing I'm gonna let the compressors down the line take care of that and I chose a, a I chose a, a release time that that gives me enough time for the low end to come through but also keeps it in time I'm using a ratio of six to one which is a little high for me now to make up for what I've lost um, this is crazy All I'm doing with this parallel chain is I'm, I'm, I'm cutting a lot of top, adding a lot of bottom, and I'm going to sneak that back in. Let's start with this guy down at zero and bring it back up. Okay, so now we're back to where we started. So now we've got everything under control a little bit before we send it to our next block. Our next block, if you remember last week, is, is a drum sub. Now all I'm trying to accomplish with this, with this section is a little, very gentle 1K boost. It looks like somewhere around 4dB. And then this is, I had so much 50, it was it was pushing my meters crazy, so um, look at this, look at this cue. It's pretty narrow. Yeah, it's pretty narrow. You can see I'm, I'm barely going on either side. And then if we're doing a, uh, a, a program drum song, like a hip hop or urban song, We'll use that guy, and if we're doing a rock, I'd probably use this guy. Some people call this guy glue. Kind of just makes everything kind of work together. Now we've we've discussed the way I use this ad nauseum, so let's just move on and go down the line. We've made our our ozone five. Everything before this is designed to make it happy, so we're giving it pre-compressed stuff so the compressors don't have to work too hard we're giving it a little more mid-range than it needs so it so it, so it'll, whatever we lose we make up for we're, we're controlling the, the the low end so that it's not working too hard on the low end let's see if it's happy Now you can see I'm taking out some good stuff, but I didn't really need it. It was just too much. Now you can you can use your own judgment on that. A little thing just to kind of keep in, in, in our philosophy of giving, everything is designed to make the, the Ozone 5 happy. Another thing that might make it happy is to pre-limit a little bit before you get there. So let's try this. Okay hey guys, I'm gonna show you something. Okay, watch the meters right here. Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna add the L2. Essentially, it didn't go up. It might've gone up a 10th of a dB, but you saw how much extra volume I, I, I got without any, without any extra levels. Think in terms of, of mid-range, is perceived as loudness so we want to work our mid-range we want to get rid of as much mud as possible we want to keep our compressors and limiters down the chain happy 
and not have them have to squash like 8 million dB or something. Everything, little bite here, little bite there, and by the time you get to the end, uh, you're, you're pretty doggone loud. I mean, that's as loud as any record you're going to find. Bold statement, maybe not, I don't know. Seems like it's louder than everything. Okay, hope you got something out of that, guys. And I, I ran out of time. I was going to show you the snare, but the snare is kind of boring. It, it, it's not contributing that much to what the, what the uh, compressors are doing, but you guys are smart. We've done a million snares, so it's just the same process again. Okay? All right. Our guest today is one of the industry's biggest thinkers, biggest talents, and one of our best friends. We are happy to welcome back. It's been a minute. Greg Wells. Hey, Thank you so much. Hey, up, man. Buddy? How are you? Thank you for having me back. Big 2018 for you, sir. From building a new studio, Greatest Showman soundtrack, life stuff. Let's start with Greatest Showman, because that's literally one of the biggest albums of the year, right? And you were thrown into a situation that was already moving, correct? The process was already moving and you got stuck in the middle of it? Tell us about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just met with the director yesterday. He came to my studio, Michael Gracie, mm -hmm. who hired me to get involved in the first place. And we were just sort of like reflecting on what just happened, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and he had been on the project for seven years. Oh, and he, wow. told me, he told me some stuff that almost derailed the whole thing that I didn't even know. Um, which I'm not sure I'm at, I'm at liberty to talk about, but just, you know, the people that are on the screen beside me, like, m at one point thought they weren't going to make the movie. Wow. Um, and, uh, and Michael just kept trying to, like, string it all together and make it move forward. And every day he would get yelled at by executives saying, mm -hmm. you've never made a movie before, you mm -hmm. don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. When I came on board four years into making the film, um, I got the same stuff. People weren't yelling at me, but they were saying, like, that's not how we do this in movies. Yeah, that's not you're not you from do. this space. Yeah, you don't know. This is a different thing. Now, it's true. Mm -hmm. All of that is true. And you do mix differently in movies. And I didn't know about that. Mm -hmm. um, Paul Massey is, is, is a really fascinating guy that I humbly recommend you ask to come on the show at some Lovely. point. He is a lovely... Uh, Englishman who actually lived in Canada for 13 years. He was in Toronto. Oh, he's in then. <laughs> he's <laughs> right. good. Well, the Canadian <laughs> mafia. Absolutely, right here. Right here. Uh, but he's he's really fantastic, and uh, he just mixed the new Bohemian Rhapsody movie. Oh, like he's cool. great. He mm. you know he did he did Walk the Line. He mm. did some work on Ready Player One. He's one of those people. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, you know, Greg, when you're in a, uh, a movie theater and, and people's eyebrows are 14 feet wide, you want to hear more depth. You want to hear more low-end depth mm. and I kind of didn't know what he meant until I finally went to the big one of the big um, Fox mixing stages mm -hmm. on the on the the lot of mm -hmm. 20th Century Fox and it is a movie theater mm -hmm. it's a huge movie theater and they've taken all the seats out and the last <clears throat> third or quarter of the theater is this massive Harrison mixing console um, that's Paul mm -hmm. uh, and you need a golf cart to get you know, from one end to the other, like the Foley guy. Foley is, uh, you know, sound effects, like a cup being yep. placed on a table or birds or whatever train going by. That guy's got his own console that's connected. It's part of the Harrison console. Um, but anyway, when I was there and watching it, mm -hmm. I immediately understood what he meant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That it does, because it is bigger, it's more immersive mm -hmm. than just listening in headphones or on speakers. It's mm -hmm. this thing that just, you know, the room is dark, you're staring at this huge screen, and I got what he meant. Um, Did that process of having those visuals import information to you differently then inform you in the way that you approach the music from writing to making it? How did, was that part of it? Massively. Mm. I, I had never worked on a, on a movie before. I'd never tried to make music to a visual picture before, mm -hmm. except for like when I was 19 and 20 when I did some TV commercials. You mm -hmm. know? But those are like 30 seconds. It's not quite the same thing. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I noticed that if I would turn off the video, which were scenes from the movie, which was shot beautifully, right. uh, that the music would start to sound a bit different. It started to sound a little more like a record, like a little more controlled, a little more contained, like we need them to do through speakers. Mm -hmm. But when I would put the, you know, whatever the Pro Tools shortcut is for getting the video to come back on, I, the music felt too safe, mm -hmm. and I needed it to sort of match what I perceived to be the energy coming off the performers. Mm -hmm. Um, and after working on it for about a month, Michael Gracie, the film director, who comes from music videos, mm. 
and TV advertisements uh, um, for Michel Gondry's company, who's a great French director mm -hmm. who also did a lot of music videos and started doing those crazy French TV commercials where they have a big budget and they take a lot of chances and get really creative. And now he's a film director mm -hmm. and Michael's following in his footsteps. But Michael turned to me and he said, he said, Greg, you're, you're making the visuals look different. And I wasn't sure if that was good or bad. Through your really, music. The music yeah. was informing him differently. And it's the same music that he'd been hearing for, wow. I don't know, probably a couple of years. Wow. But I, whatever I was doing to it, he said, you're making, not only does the music sound different, and he, thankfully he was liking what the music sounded like, but he said, you're making it look like a different That's movie. That's an incredible compliment. And well, and so, but I said, I wasn't, you know, I've only been on this for a month, but it's the movie that's telling me how to... It was working both ways. ...mix it mm -hmm. and make it feel. And It was a crazy project because he really gave me full access. He gave me carte blanche to use everything that had been done, which there were different producers throughout the years, going all the way back to the original demos. Mm -hmm. It was all lined up, all like locked in the time code and synced up and very organized. There'd be demo one, sometimes demo two, producer number one, all their tracks, producer number two, sometimes all their tracks. He let you access all that. But I had everything. Wow. Were you, um, were you like rewriting the songs or more just kind of adding additional production and mixing them? What, what, what was your I did zero, zero writing. It's all, um, it's all the, the, these incredible songwriters, Justin Paul and Benj Pasek, mm -hmm. who, uh, uh, they have a huge hit musical on their hands right now called Dear Evan Hansen. Yep, exactly. Which, uh, there they are, which you guys should see. It's just amazing. I took Nina, my wife, to see mm -hmm. it the other night. It's playing here in town now. And mm. It's about to start touring nationally. It's really um, changing the game. You know, I'm not really like a musical guy. I'm not really into Broadway musicals, mm -hmm. but when it's turned on its head like that, I'm. it's just phenomenal. They're about. great. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you pick parts from the different producers and put them together? So Michael, the director, said, here's everything. You're welcome to use all of it, some of it, none of it. You can replace everything. You can replay everything yourself. You can bring in musicians. You can whatever we need. Because they were sort of in a quandary at that point. Mm -hmm. They were six months out a little more than half a year out from where they knew they had to finish mm -hmm. to release it for Christmas. Mm, that's a big period. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so I was brought in to kind of fix it, mm -hmm. you know, and not really fix it, that sort of cheapens it, but to kind of wrangle border collie everything, because everything sounded really good. The songs are all quite different. Some are operatic, some are straight up pop songs, some sound like Earth, Wind and Fire, like mm -hmm. it's all over the place, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't sound like it all belonged in the same movie. Mm. And so he, Michael just thought, I need a record producer to come in who's also a musician, who can play things if needed, who can pivot or change the chord. If we cut two seconds out of a scene, then how, if that screws the song up, how do you suture that? How do you fix that? How do you make it seamless? And it was, Challenging. I mean, I was really, you know, it was a baptism by fire. Oh, I can me. actually give you a quote from you during the process. Uh, <laughs> we, we were talking on the phone. I think we were arranging one of our dinners. And you literally, at some point in time, jumped on the phone. I said, how you doing, man? He said, I'm so stressed. And kind of held that note up there for a minute. And yeah, you know, just in the sounds right. Of a, but how long what, were you? Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, what, what's interesting about their call for you, well, two sides to it, as you've learned, and what I've observed from people on the show and just my own love of movies, mm. it's an incredible committee process with lots of masters and... Big, big budgets. So for somebody to say, I'm going to bring you on, you've never done a movie before, I'm going to give you everything to mess with, either he's taking the risk, somebody is being the shield so you can go do what they need to do. So that's, one, a testament to him, but also a oh, testament yeah. to the way I think about you in that they found somebody who has can wear so many hats to border collie this process because it would take somebody who looks at things in multiple ways and still, because you, to me, have a way, when I think about you, I try to think about what category is. Craig, a songwriter? Does that, what does he call himself first? A producer? Because you write, you play, you produce, you mix, you engineer. Um, and then you also find a balance between, because you love gear, but you never forget the humanity of music, in my opinion. Is that a fair description of 
yeah. who you are? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just a fan of like a great story. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so much of, of, of my career has been stuff that I haven't written. Mm. A lot of it has been too, but it's, I don't care if I've written it or not. I just mm -hmm. need to really click with the music. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's sort of like being asked to make food that I don't like the taste of. I wouldn't right. want me to be the one making that food, nor right. would I know when it was good. Right. So, um, you know, I kind of liken it to getting excited about an amazing thing that deserves having a photograph taken of it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what's the right lens? What's the right lighting? What, are we on film? Is this digital? Is it, is it, I don't know. I don't know much about cameras, but it's, it's the metaphor I'm trying to make. I love the capturing of it. Mm -hmm. And like that, uh, like Socrates said, the wise man knows nothing. Like, you know, mm -hmm. when, you, when, you, when you learn a little bit, then you realize, oh, there's a lot more to learn. And then you get up to that plateau and you kind of look over, oh, there's a lot more to learn. And the more I learn, the realize, like, I'll never learn a tenth of what there is to know mm -hmm. about this stuff. So mm -hmm. I'm constantly... It was working with Joe Ciccarelli on Mika's first album in mm -hmm. 2006 that taught me the importance of gear. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't really care about it before, mm -hmm. actually. I didn't have the bug for gear. I didn't. I just thought... I actually remember thinking all compressors kind of sound the same. Mm -hmm. At that point, I could tell microphones sounded not the same. But I remember being like 12 in Canada and thinking all electric guitars sound the same. I couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. I didn't, it, I hadn't trained my ear to hear the differences. Um, now I hear too much difference with everything. <laughs> it's like the tiniest little thing is like big step for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I live in, in the world of minutia, but paying attention to the minutia, as you both know so well, mm -hmm. The devil is in the details. God is in the details. You know, they're both in the details. Absolutely. Like, God and the you, devil. You build yeah. the, the quality of the architecture of the building when you really are macro and micro with this stuff. It just sings. It has a freedom to it. It mm -hmm. rings like a bell, mm -hmm. like a beautifully made bell. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of structure and planning that goes into making a bell. You can't, if you screw that up, it's not going to sound good. It's not going to look good. Mm -hmm. You recently created a plug-in. And Ooh. it's it's a yeah. throwback to some things that are things that you could count on and would do things that you know you could control, but yet be special. And even the way it looks seems simple. Tell us about the El Rey. Well, I think it was I think it was the composer Rimsky Korsakov who said, "If you really want to be modern, you have to return to tradition." Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I heard stuff like that when I was younger, I thought that's just boring old man. Mm -hmm. Boring crap. And like then we you got drank your own Kool Aid, and you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and but there's something about a lot of the early recording technology that they, the they people, whoever they are, mm -hmm. they really got right. Mm -hmm. I've never heard a better vocal compressor than my RCA BA six B. Mm -hmm. I just haven't. I don't understand what's going on. In it. And there was an engineer. There is an engineer named Joe Zook who worked with me on One Republic's Ryan Tedder mm -hmm. on their first album. Joe mm -hmm. engineered and mixed that album. Yeah, Joe's a beast. Joe's a beast. I want Joe on the show, but... Joe should be on the show. Joe is an incredible, incredible engineer. I met him at um, Sound Factory on Selma when he was working there as a house engineer, and then he wound up working with, with Jack Joseph Puig for a number of years and learned a lot from that and then branched out on his own. So he had an RCA compressor that wasn't this one. It was, uh, I can't remember the model number. Mm -hmm. And he would run everything through it. We were putting snare drums through it, guitars. I think we put vocals through it. We put a lot of stuff through it. And he would always say, listen to the difference. And it just did this thing where it just made things not louder, just made them sound bigger. I know that's really amorphous and doesn't mean anything, but it, it made it sound some, bigger. Yeah. To In me, the context it of a mix, it's everything. Made it sound more like a record to me. Yeah. It sounded better. Hard to be more... I can't quantify more than that, but it was really incredible. So when that record was over, of course, when I got like some little check-in, I immediately blew it on gear and I went on eBay and found the RCA compressor that I have now and, and retubed it and gave it to a great tech. I can't remember which tech it was, but then it just came back sounding like the holy grail. It's yeah. beautiful and, I, and it still sounds the same. I just leave it on all the time. Um, so this... This whole plug-in thing uh, with Acoustica Audio and uh, Studio DMI came about totally organically. They, Acoustica makes some 
unbelievable plugins mm-hmm. that sound amazing, but they also look amazing. Like mm-hmm. really, really yeah. the coolest looking plugins I, I may have ever seen. Mm-hmm. So I, out of enthusiasm, because I do get excited about this stuff, mm-hmm. uh, people often think I'm like hawking uh, gear, like I'm getting paid or something to say. I'm not, I'm just crazy. I get so excited about it. Yeah. I grew up with such bad sound. Mm-hmm. Like the PA in my dad's church was so <laughs> bad. And the interference of the taxi drivers driving by, the CB radios coming through was louder than the mic on my dad or whoever was talking. So everything sounded bad. The PA system. 10 Jesus. Totally. <laughs> All the clubs in Peterborough, like the PA systems were just crap in the mm-hmm. 70s and 80s. It was awful. It would have sounded better if they'd shut them off and you just hear it acoustically. So I'm obsessed with great sound. So um, I took a screenshot. No, I actually took a photo with my phone of my computer monitor of, I think it was Cream, Acoustica's plug-in Cream. Yes, yeah, beautiful. Too. And just said, this is amazing, just raving about it. That was it. It was a post on my Instagram. And at some point, I heard from them. They wrote to me and they said, hey, thank you very much. And mm-hmm. then, uh, uh, then they said, you know, if you ever want to do a plug-in with us, like maybe we should talk about it. And as soon as they said that, I was like looking at my RCA compressor, which is just, here's my console, mm-hmm. here's my first equipment rack, and it sits on the top of that first rack. It's just there. Mm-hmm. Kind of looking at it going, well, that would be amazing to capture that somehow. Mm-hmm. And I just, thinking out loud, a stream of consciousness said all of that to them. And they were like, okay. Let's go. Let's try it. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so they actually wound up taking several of my compressors in the studio, and uh, they, uh, those compressors took a vacation in Italy. And uh, uh, Luca Pratalesi came yeah. to my studio, Luca. who's Studio DMI, mm-hmm. and uh, came and, and he took a bunch of my compressors and promised me they'd be fine. And they went to Italy. And, uh, and I don't understand quite how they do what they do, um, the first batch coming back to me was really, really, really good, but I felt that the bottom end was not right. Mm. And to me, that was the whole point mm-hmm. of like, I really want this to sound like I've got this thing on an analog insert. Like I've strapped the real beast mm-hmm. across a track and I'm hearing it go through the transformers and the tubes and doing mm-hmm. that whole thing. And everything was right except that low kind of thumpy just... Mm-hmm. <laughs> that girthy thing down there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took a minute to capture that. It's hard, you know? It's really hard for software to sound like that. I've never actually heard software do it the way that analog stuff can. It's the one thing I don't think software can quite do yet. Mm-hmm. Unless you just reached for the knob all the way on the left and turn it up. Is that it? That's the bass, yeah. Did everyone hear that? <laughs> Going back to your plug-in. Uh, I, I was I was blessed to get a copy of it, and it really is good. Oh, thank it you! It really is good. So it got to the point, the level that you needed to do both the girth they at the bottom. They were really patient the... with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were really patient with me, and you know, I remember being obsessed with like, like there was this scratch there between fast and slow, mm-hmm. the attack and the release, where it says fast and slow. You see, there's like two little X's mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. It was too much for me. Mm. And then I would say, can you just make it more subtle? And then it was like not enough for me. And so there were like maybe eight emails back and forth about that particular scratch on the visual. So, so let, me, let me get this straight. You're worried about the visual more than the sound. Is well, no, we saying. got the sound locked okay. in. Okay. Okay, just well, just that's because he developed it after <laughs> Greatest Showman. Because that's of visual true. now. That's, that's right. right. Yeah, I'm deaf yeah. at this point, but I wanted it to look I right. might say that there's some awesome presets available on, when you buy this plugin. Do you have any favorite? <laughs> Mine. <laughs> really? Yeah. And how long, then, then how long you want to get some bass, use one of mine for bass. How long was the development process of getting this right? Did it take a year? Did it take a... About half a year. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And... May until, like, literally today. So now it's, it's kicking behind. Should we... Uh, I understand that you're going to get... Let our audience be able to to maybe win a few. Is that correct? I would love that. Yeah, I'm just really excited about it. I want people to hear this thing that I just love. I love being able to have, you know... Oddly enough, I think you can you can feel whatever that is you just described in that last sentence come mm. through the speakers when you use this plug-in. Oh, it's amazing. It so really as you can does. see on the screen, 
If you go enter your email address at bit.ly forward slash win L Ray, because the plugin is called the L Ray, which yep. I don't think we've established. I right? wanted to call, I had like the general for a minute, and then I thought that felt too military. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I wanted it to sort of like the boss, the king, and all that. It was like too, you know, mm -hmm. I'm Canadian, I can't call a thing. Right, king right, right. Or the boss. right. Um, and then I started like translating it, translating that into other languages on Google. And just messing around, and El Ray came up, and I'm like, "That's it!" Mm -hmm. It just Bang jumped in. out at me. I just, I love, I love those words. I love mm -hmm. the Spanish language, mm -hmm. and it just softened it the king. El Ray. Right. So, how many are we giving away? Are, we, are you giving away ten? I think that's uh, as many as possible. I don't know what the number is. Okay. But it's more than three. And people should enter up to what Christmas, or is there a time? There's a cutoff. Do we know? We don't know. I don't know. Okay. So, but it'll be detailed there. Yeah, so enter at bit.ly forward slash win L Ray. You'll get to a landing page, it'll have some details. It's your opportunity to get something that Greg has finely tuned to a, obviously a certain level of excellence. It also is a cool looking piece of gear that you yeah. may want to have in your in your rack. Well, it's, it's out. When does this air? On Friday? Mm -hmm. So, playing with linear time, it's out today. That's exactly right, which would be Black Friday. Yeah. That's exactly correct. So it's your opportunity. Thanks to uh, Greg Wells and his partners. It's a really good thing. Um, you play lots of different things, but I know at the heart, the drum is an important piece to you. Mm -hmm. I know during the Pensado Awards, you did this crazy drum solo and put together these incredible songs and so on and so forth. And I remember as I was sitting on the side, as like really anxious, you know, executive producer, host stuff, for about two minutes, I just was like at a concert. And, mm -hmm. but part of it was just the joy of you playing. Yeah. Like you <laughs> just, just yeah. got to go play and it, it was so cool to see. <laughs> so one of the coolest things about the award show was uh, some of the people you've worked with and friends that um, contributed, people like James Corden, Hugh Jackman, Keith Urban, Quincy Jones, Katy Perry, there was a whole list more. But what was evident was their love for what you did with their musical process, and they were happy to reciprocate. Hi, Gregory. It's your favorite artist, Katy. And you're an incredible songwriter, incredible producer, incredible instrument player of all kinds, and just a visionary, and you deserve it. You deserve to be celebrated. I love you! You are a great man with a, a beautiful face, and I cannot wait to kiss you on the mouth one more time. There's no one more humble than you, uh, which is amazing considering how incredibly talented you are. I love working with you, and there's a reason why you got this award. It really is. You're, you're a badass. I have much respect for you. You're just beginning, man. You're the future. I will always be there for you. It's my man Greg Wells winning the Passato Awards. Salute to the greatest master mixer producer in the game. Congratulations, Greg. I'm Mix Master Mike. I'm out. Peace. So there's a number of areas, speaking of drums, that, that you, you know, there's a philanthropic side that you've had a long time. So you actually give drum kits to, to people. People can win drum kits from you. Yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, it just stems from me being nuts about, and nuts about drums. Mm -hmm. I was just watching some incredible 60 Minutes piece about somebody doing philanthropic stuff, giving things away that they're passionate about. And mm -hmm. I was like, I had a, I, I TiVo'd it. And I was watching it at midnight, I was by myself, and I remember just going, I think I want to give away drums to people that <laughs> want, you know, that don't, that want them but don't have them, which mm -hmm. is actually really hard to find. I thought it would be easier to find those folks, but it's, it, it has proved to be kind of challenging. Mm -hmm. But I have given away 17 drum sets. Have you really? How yeah. long has this gone on? For I think the first one was like 2014 or something like that. Wow. Um, and I stopped doing it for a little bit. I stopped after 12 or so because I just I couldn't get people to enter the contest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I got sort of like... Get disillusioned. Huh? Yeah, I'm like, yeah. are you kidding me? Yeah, you know, exactly. I would have freaked out if... I mean, basically, I was the kid that wanted drums that, that for... I don't think we could afford drums, mm -hmm. that's why. And I think maybe my parents didn't want the noise of the drums too, but mm -hmm. both were true. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Um, and then you also give away scholarships as well, to, hum, to your, the school you went to? to I'm doing three scholarships now. Wow. I started as one, now it's at three to Humber College, because mm -hmm. I, I went there. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and now with the help of Roland, 
who are the friendliest folks, mm -hmm. uh, they I, I give away a Roland synth every three months. Nice. And the most recent uh, winner was this guy in, uh, I can't remember what country it is, but he's in Africa. Very cool. And they got it to him. And Very he just cool. emailed me a couple days ago with a picture of him playing it and sent me a little clip. And, um, uh, you know, and I, I'm trying, I, A, I'm surprised more people don't do it because it's not expensive to do. Mm -hmm. It's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and there was a B, and I don't know what it was. Well, the B that I think you alluded to is that there are companies in the audio space that will partner in terms of those kinds of outreach things with the right people. I'm trying to, to find the right them. Thing. Mm -hmm. I've spoken to some microphone companies about giving away mics, and mm -hmm. I can't get anyone to, to buy yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. Different, different folks are more inclined than other folks. We, we see it with our show. Um, you get, I, yeah, you must. Yeah, we see it a lot. I don't have any sort of insight into it. I just want to... Do I want to make the world a happier place, mm -hmm. and I feel mm -hmm. like music is a really great way to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, God forbid that people want to professionally go into music. You mm -hmm. have to be a certain kind of wiring to want that, you know? For sure. Uh, we need people to come into music, but I love that music just like raises your self-esteem, it raises your confidence, it raises, it lets you express yourself in a way that's mm -hmm. different. You know, it's another language, it's a really powerful language for telling your own story. Mm -hmm. um, Several times you said that you don't listen to pop music, you don't listen to pop radio. Why, why is that? Well, I don't listen to it very much. Oh. I almost don't listen to it. Oh, okay. Um, because it's terrible. <laughs> it's so bad. It's not, well, let me ask you this then. Is it's it possible? So bad. To, is and, it possible? And by the way, it always has been. Is it possible to have a chord in pop music that's too complex? Oh, yeah. Is that your problem with it? No, no, I so think you, it's, it's... Can you listen to a 1-4-5 song? Yeah, the, some of the best songs have two chords. I think simplicity is much harder to do than complexity. You say it on the show all the time. I think that's the hardest. It takes hard, a genius that, to be simple. That's why I'm in pop music. I don't view myself at all as a pop musician. I'm not. I'm a really indulgent down the bottom of the rabbit hole, bouncing off the bottom of the rabbit hole. That's mm -hmm. where I live. But I find it very hard to be simple and, <clears throat> and hopefully at a level of excellence. Mm -hmm. And I honestly don't think I've ever pulled it off. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing I'm chasing hard because mm -hmm. i it's so hard for me to do mm -hmm. what, what exactly are you chasing i missed that like simplicity at a level of excellence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's way harder to me than playing a 30-minute piano sonata yeah. mm -hmm. it is and and it's harder to write and it's harder to play yeah. it's harder to play eighth notes mm -hmm. on a bass guitar just what about those metal guys? Eat your mother, eat your father. What about them? They have to play a lot of 16th and 8th notes. The, well, they're playing 32nd notes. That's true. It's, it's actually, it's easier to play fast. It's easier for me to... I can do that for the next 30 minutes. It is hard to play slow. But to just go... Yeah, that's On a bass so guitar. True. Or on anything. Totally exposed. Uh -huh. Sorry, I'm being annoying, but I'm trying to make a point. That yeah. Well, you're rushing, but anyway. Sorry, you of course count. I am. Canadian. <laughs> um, it's that, is, or, or quarter notes, or whole mm -hmm. notes. Mm -hmm. You know, it, and I think it was Handel or Haydn that said the invention of a simple melody is a work of genius. It was mm -hmm. one of those mm -hmm. H's, one of those amazing classical masters. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope I'm answering your question. <laughs> no, you did. Um, uh, you and I both like forms of music that, that, that seem to not be popular, you know, classical, jazz. I'm not the biggest affection out of those forms, but I do like them, you know? And uh, why do you think that is? Do you think, do you think that the complexity of those musical forms isn't tailor-made for the, the society that Herb was describing at the beginning of the show? Or does it take education to understand those types of music and like them? Or what, why, yes. why is... Why don't we have those forms now that, that should be as popular as anything on uh, Spotify right now? You know, at some point, I had a little penny drop in my feeble brain that... Because I had all those questions, and, and I would look at the charts and go, why is Kendrick Lamar on the same chart as someone in the shallow end of the pop pool? Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't have to name names, but we can all fill those mm -hmm. names in. So. Mm -hmm because there's art 
and then there's entertainment. And then there's all these points in between. Mm -hmm. And some of my favorite stuff is really entertaining art, or sometimes the pop is so mm -hmm. pop, it swings over and becomes uh, pop art. Could it be the same thing when you said that when you were a kid you couldn't tell one guitar sound from the other? You know, it, I think education and... Like, for instance, um, you know, putting my 15-year-old, well, he just turned 16, putting my 16-year-old in front of a, you know, sitting him down and making him listen to Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Mm -hmm. By the way, that was my mom's favorite song, or piece. It's just, it's one of my favorite. I, yes. I'm a huge Stravinsky fan. I don't know if he'd make it to the end. Maybe he would. Mm hmm uh, odds are he probably zone out at some point, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember um, in high school, in my English class in Peterborough, we were studying Macbeth. And I'd never really been introduced to Shakespeare before. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't really understand what they were talking about from just reading the words. It's, you know, what is that? Is it 500 years ago, Shakespeare? I'm not sure. It sits around that. And English, English was just a really different language then. Um, but we studied it and we analyzed it and we learned what was going on and it's just one of the best stories ever. Mm -hmm. So then I thought from that, well, I like Shakespeare. And I I just started attending Humber in Toronto and Kenneth Branagh, that great wow. cool. uh, English wow. act actor, was doing a stage version of King Lear downtown Toronto. I thought, well, I'm going to go see that. that this will be great. I'll like it like I like Macbeth. I didn't understand one, one sentence, sentence of the entire... I had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. and it, I was so angry by the end of it. So I think you have to, like... I remember when I went to Humber also, Humber, at the time, at least my perception of how they presented themselves, they said, we are a contemporary music school. And I thought, great, I love contemporary music. That's what I'd like to do for a living. When I got there, it was 90% to maybe 99% a hardcore early 60s bebop school. Mm -hmm. And I had not ever been exposed to that music. I didn't play a note of it. Mm -hmm. And I went to the head of the keyboard department and said, I've made a mistake. After two or three weeks, I went to this guy. He's unfortunately passed away, Brian Harris, lovely man. And I said, this isn't what I thought it was. I'm the wrong guy. I'm, it's not a, not a fit. And he said, Can, just give me 24 hours. And he found a band uh, forgive me if I've told the story before. Mm -hmm. um, he found a, an ensemble there that did uh, Tower of Power and Earth, Wind and & Fire. Wow. And they had four singers and a full horn section and a full rhythm section, mm -hmm. and I was in heaven. And mm -hmm. he got me in as an additional keyboard player. Mm -hmm. And that kept me there. And then I learned the language of jazz mm -hmm. slowly and very awkwardly and embarrassingly in front of all these hotshot jazzer guys that just... You know, I'm still friends with a lot of them. They grew up listening to Dizzy Gillespie. And I'm sure. like, who's that? Like, what, you know? So I think you have to acclimate. You have to... Yeah. Um, you, it, it, it requires more, but also I think that people's attention spans have changed massively yeah. over not just the last 10 years, but over several hundred years, you know? Mm. Like, e even Japanese film. Like, we were talking about Kira Kurosawa. If you mm -hmm. will look at his films, they weren't made that long ago. Mm -hmm. 20, 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. The attention span factor watching those things, it's so slow. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. demanding. Long edits. It's very demanding, it's but demanding. that wasn't demanding for them. Right. Nor was it demanding for most people to mm -hmm. listen to a 45-minute, uh, you know, classical piece mm -hmm. when they were being written in the 1700s, 1800s, mm -hmm. or even early mm -hmm. 1900s. Now it's like Twitter. Yeah. Like, what's your sound bite? Well, wouldn't you say then that... that that the popular music of today fits the the popular culture of today? Because I, even I find myself being a little short on attention span sometimes when it comes to... Well, I think it's really hard to write a great song that is three, three and a half, four minutes long that hits that level of like, oh, wow, you know? Mm -hmm. I'll, I've never done it. I'll probably never do it. But when it's done, You've well... You've already done it. Well, I've tried a billion times, but when it's done really well, mm -hmm. it's, for me, like the most pleasing thing. Mm -hmm. As much as I like to say, well, most pop music is horrible, and I fully stand by that. Mm -hmm. I think it's always been that way. I think most restaurants are making food that's not very good. I think most movies that have been made throughout the ages have not been very good. Mm -hmm. It's the stuff that is amazing that sticks out, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think if you go to, like, people will say, oh, the music was so great, and then pick your era. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, in the 60s, in the 30s, mm -hmm. 
but there was there were tons of crappy pieces of music written during that time. It's just it's mm. the stuff we remember that really stands the test of time, and that will be true of today as well. Mm. There'll be stuff that still sounds good 30 years from now, but mm. you know, I often say it's hard to find anyone really good at anything, mm -hmm. and that that's okay. Are you, are you one of those people that says uh, jazz stopped at Kind of Blue? Kind of Blue is my favorite album that I've ever heard. Everybody's favorite album, but it's, a lot of people think that jazz hasn't progressed since then. Well, Miles Davis said jazz has become museum music, and that's when he was alive, you know, which was yeah. a while ago. So I get it. I sort of know what that means. Um, that is my favorite jazz album to listen to. It's my favorite album to listen to. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. That I mean, favorite just, things. You probably like favorite things, too. I like that whole era. I like, like all the West Montgomery records from that era. Incredible. I, I also, I don't know if jazz stopped. I mean, I think the category changed. Education for a second. Um, mm -hmm. Like we're, f we were talking about some things that I think tie together, which has to do with today's learner. And that learner can be 18 to 80. It doesn't necessarily mean an age thing, but just in the environment of today's world. So, for instance, we are fans of the Blackbird Academy, amongst other things, because I think they have balanced the qualitative level of excellence with efficiency. So it's not necessarily a four-year school. It's what you'll learn in four months there. Mm. Is and the experiences that you'll get and the hands-on practical application and the level of the teachers and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's not just real because they work with us. No, no, no. There's no place like it. It's you've, unbelievable. What you've they gone there as huge, not yeah. only somebody who has spoken there, but you've also had your kid attend there. Yes, my oldest, my oldest child. Give us. Uh, just is, he just did the program. He finished uh, this past July. It's his favorite six months of his life. Mm -hmm. And he knows more than I do at this point about mm. so many things. I mean, there's so, it's a genius idea because thankfully John McBride is passionate enough to build a place like Blackbird Studios. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So there's that, just full stop. And then, you know, eyeing the building next door to Blackbird and then thinking the quality of the assistants coming through the door here aren't as good as they should be. We should start our own school so we can have better people applying to work here. Mm -hmm. I think that was really part of his, his if not the thing driving him wanting to start a school. Mm -hmm. So he starts a school, a hop, skip, and a jump, not even, like mm -hmm. literally next door to the best studio possibly in the world. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're there as a student, you get a week in the classroom, and then you get a week in Blackbird Studios. Mm -hmm. And you're not watching people doing stuff and standing in the back of the control. And your sleeves rolled up. You're like in there. You're Mike and Paul Franklin's pedal steel. You're cutting tape. You're whatever. All of it. Yep. It's very like you're neck deep in the garden. And then you do a week back in the classroom. And by the way, the classroom is one of the coolest rooms very cool. anywhere. Mm -hmm. It has an API console and it's got some ISO booths. Mm -hmm. And um, I've become very friendly with Mark Rubel, who, mm -hmm. who is yeah. the co-director of the Blackbird Academy. And yep. he's a you know, a lifelong music producer who owns over 60 compressors himself. Wow. Tune in next week for part two with the incredible Greg Wells. Mm -hmm.